Hello everyone, I'm Thomas Verbeek. I'm from the University of Otago, New Zealand. I'm currently a master's thesis student and I'm going to be talking about the canvas element and HTML5. So, a little bit of coverage on why I decided to talk about the canvas element. Um, and I said I'm a master's student uh, in software development, but I also like to moonlight as a, a 3D artist. So I do a lot of 3D work. Here's a slide from some stuff that I've done. I also work for a company in Dunedin that specializes in photorealistic graphics. So you could say that I'm the kind of man that likes pretty pictures and making them. So when Tony suggested, hey, this might be a little bit outside what you're usually used to, but would you like to do some drawing with the canvas element? I thought, sure, I'll give it a shot. So the canvas element, you probably came here with a lot of questions and I've probably tried to, I'm going to try and cover and please you as much as possible. You're probably wondering what is the canvas element itself? Uh, how can we do things with it? How, how do you interact with it? How can I use to draw cats? I'm surprised the people that talk about HTML stuff always seem to quote cats. Um, I've seen that there's a few Anvil references going on as well among software developers, so interesting. Um, afterwards, I'm probably going to show you guys how to do some awesome stuff with Canvas. So the HTML5 specification says that um, the Canvas element is a resolution-dependent bitmap canvas that can be used for rendering graphs, game graphics, other visual images on the fly. If you want to put that in layman's terms, basically you're getting a rectangle in your HTML page, and you can use uh, JavaScript to interact with this rectangle and do all sorts of drawing. The usual syntax for specifying the canvas element goes along the lines of canvas slash canvas. Originally, the canvas element was designed to be a standalone tag like the image tag. However, due to Firefox doing their own thing, it requires a closing tag that allows you to, say, specify something within those tags in case there's a compatibility issue, so you've got a fallback. So, when it comes to browser support, Internet Explorer 9.0 Plus seems to be the most compliant with HTML5 Canvas. If you want to use the Canvas in Internet Explorer 7 or 8, you would have to use a third-party um, library called Explorer Canvas. As for the rest of the browsers, you've got Firefox 3 Plus, Safari 3 Plus, Chrome 3 Plus, yada, yada, yada. Most others now support it. This is in contrast to the CSS stuff that we saw in the previous talk. Um, where it's still not completely uh, compliant across all browsers. So the usual syntax is we define a canvas element. We can give it attributes such as uh, a width and a height. These are some two basic ones. How about we have a look what this looks like in the actual browser? Well, surprise, surprise, it looks like nothing. If you were to put this on your browser window, you just get an empty space. We can use some CSS styling to quickly add a border to it, and you'll see that all of a sudden you're going to get a rectangle with a nice little dotted line. And you probably can't see it on this projector, but I tried. Cool. So if we specify an ID for this element, we can go find it in our document object model. As a matter of fact, we can have multiple canvi, if that's a plural. And uh, we can identify them with a unique identifier. So I've got one called Nyan. So I can go into my JavaScript, which is that little snippet below that says, Cat canvas is document docket element by ID Nyan. So blank canvas is pretty boring. So JavaScript is used to interact with the campus, uh, canvas. I'm going to explain to you guys the notion of um, sketching and stroking. Uh, not supposed to be taken out of context here. Um, so it's, it's got a bit of an artist paradigm going towards it. Um, also going to be covering on the fact that you're working with a context, and I'm going to show you how to draw some rectangles, lines, arcs, and more exciting stuff. So drawing shapes. This was one of the first tests I did when I started experimenting with Canvas, so drawing a simple rectangle. Every Canvas has a drawing context. So there is, um, the, the, the drawing context uh, defines uh, a whole bunch of ways that you can interact. So the basic steps that you would follow is you, you go and use JavaScript to um, find your canvas in the document object model. Then you call the get context method, which I'm about to show you how that works. And that's where you actually start doing your actual drawing. So in order to draw shapes, we say, all right, we get a, a JavaScript. Um, we use JavaScript to grab our um, canvas. When we call the context, we use get context. And we have to specify 2D as uh, parameters. And after that, we can do a call, for example, fill rect, which will draw a filled rectangle starting at position 5025, which would be the top left corner. 
and then it goes 150 and 100 pixels inside. I'm going to mention that. Okay, so this is that second line that I had in the snippet over there. You have to specify 2D. As a matter of fact, at the moment, it's the only parameter that I can take. So that makes you wonder, is there actually a 3D canvas? There isn't yet. Uh, the HTML5 specification has put this in place so that if there was a future implementation of a 3D canvas, then it would allow you to do so. You can have a 3D canvas already if you use things like WebGL and interact with that. However, these are currently not HTML5 standards. So let's draw some rectangles. Um, the drawing context gives us a lot of uh, functions to work with. Here's some of the main ones that you'd use if you want to draw a rectangle. So fill style uh, basically defines uh, what style your rectangle is going to be filled with. Um, fill rect actually draws a filled rectangle um, and with the parameters that I defined before. Stroke style controls uh, the actual line that you'd get. So again, this can be a CSS color, a pattern, or a gradient. Clear rect is something funny where you can define a rectangle that works as like, a, like an eraser. Imagine you, if you had drawn a whole bunch of stuff on your canvas, you're like, I'd like to draw a big hole right in the middle. You can just plot this eraser rectangle across and it just wipe everything in that space. So I think we've got hello rectangle relatively covered. You just call fill rect, you give it the x and y position and a width and a height and it will plot it as such. Uh, curious fact, let's say you had a canvas that you're like, I would, I would like to clear this whole thing off. Simply done by saying uh, my canvas uh, with, uh, just reassign the width and it will automatically uh, put the context back to a default state. Cool, so working with this canvas, we've got our own little corner system that we have to get used to. It's basically a 2D grid. Um, it starts in the top left corner with 0, 0, and then values increase in the x and y axis uh, towards the right and downwards. So this is what the canvas roughly, the corner system would roughly look like. So I thought, hey, for this demonstration, why don't we just draw everything that you see here using the canvas element? So there's a few things that we need to um, take into consideration when drawing this, because it's got a few components in there. Uh, the main one is the grid that goes on in the background. I don't know if that was very clear from the uh, projection over there, but there's horizontal and vertical grid lines. Uh, we can draw arrows going across. Each of those arrows had a little label. This was done with text. Uh, the corner text goes in the top and bottom corners, and there was some dots also drawn in. So we're basically just going to go over each of these, and hopefully by the end of this talk, you guys are inspired enough to go and make whatever creative thing you'd like to do. So remember the main order of business. We define a canvas. We can give it an ID, give it a sizing. We use our JavaScript to go get that element, and then we go get us 2D context. Now we've got all the tools in hand to start drawing. So we can draw paths or lines. It, it follows, like I mentioned before, an artist paradigm. Imagine if you were to make a picture of something. You'd get sketching pencils, and you'd start sketching the rough outlines of things. It, you might not get it perfectly right the first time, so you make your way around, and eventually you get to a point where you say, I've plotted everything. I'm ready to put this in ink. So then you draw along your sketch lines in ink, and then you have your permanent picture. So Canvas kind of follows this sort of structure as well. We've got a few pencil methods, as I like to call them. It makes it easy to distinguish the two. Um, move to and line to. If you provide an X or Y corner, it basically positions the pencil on the canvas at a particular point. If you then say line to, it plots it to the next point that you defined. So that allows you to construct a line. This won't necessarily draw the line on the canvas. For that, you need to do other things such as um, setting the stroke style so you can define what kind of a stroke you would like to plot this line. And then the actual stroke call will ink that line on the canvas for you. And then you should see it visible. So to draw the grid, um, I don't know how many of you are programmers, I assume most of you, but we've got a loop set up. So it basically starts at 0 0.5 and it um, skips along the width of the canvas and we say at 10 pixel intervals, um, move to this position, uh, plot a line that's about the height so we start getting a vertical line and it just does this repetitively along the canvas. The horizontal lines is quite a similar story uh, except I've just flipped some variables around so that it creates the same thing going down that way. If we want to actually plot the lines, we'd have to set a stroke style. So I've just given it um, 80, 80, 80, which I'm sure is a, a light gray color. And then I say stroke, and it will then plot the lines for me. And the result will be something like this, which I don't think actually came through on the projector at all. But just trust me, it's, there's a whole bunch of lines going across. 
just to see who's quick in the audience, have you noticed that I'm starting at 0 0.5 on every, okay. Anybody want to know why? Oh, sorry, does anybody know why? Because I mean, naturally we all start at zero, right? In Canvas, every pixel, or sorry, yeah, every pixel is indexed at a, a whole number, right? So if you were to start at zero, you're starting in the top left corner of a pixel. So technically, you're in, right in the middle of two pixels. So if you were to start drawing things on the canvas, the canvas goes, ah, oh, I need to plot a line perfectly in the middle, straight down. It's going to start occupying two pixels, and it has to interpolate across them. So all of a sudden, you start getting these funny results where it left over two lines rather than one that you'd expect. So we kind of just move into the middle of the pixel and then start drawing a line out from there on. Cool, so that was the grid that we saw before. Let's start drawing some of those arrows. So now that we've got a pretty good grasp on how to draw a straight line, um, we, I've, I've got a call on the begin path, I'll cover it on the next slide on what that does, but we say, let, let's move to a particular point, um, 0, 40. I've got a line to 240, 40, so if y is kept constant, this is going to be a straight line along the x-axis for about 240 pixels. I've then got to move to, which means that it gives me a little gap. That's where I'm going to plot my letter x in my diagram. And then I do another line plot. To get the arrowhead, which is the little snippet just below there, um, I just move to that point that's just diagonally up, plot across, and then plot back down. So I've got two calls to line to, which makes sure that I actually plot the line to the next point. And of course, the y-axis is a very similar story. So if you say context.begin path, basically begins a new path. Let's say you had just done a whole bunch of uh, pencil drawing calls. Then if you don't actually start a new path, then all of a sudden they'll be connected or they'll follow the same stroke style and that sort of thing. So defining a new path allows you to do that. Um, if you are to begin a new path, make sure you always stroke before you begin a new path, because otherwise you get some very funny results. Um, finally, of course, if we want to make sure we ink our errors onto the canvas, we set a stroke style, and then we stroke. So the result of those operations would be as follows. So you should see some thick lines going across there with the error heads on the end. OK, so drawing circles is a slightly more complex. I don't think it's too difficult. There is no actual function available that allows you to just plot a circle. So we have to use something called the arc method. The arc method is basically a way of plotting arcs, but if you completely join that up, it's not much different from drawing a circle. So we've got a function there. It takes as parameters uh, an xy coordinate, so that, that's the center of the, uh, the circle that we're going to draw. It's got a radius on how far the distance goes out. We have a start angle that demonstrates on how far along we start, and then the actual angle proceeds from that point onwards, so we can just draw an arc like this. Um, direction, if you give it false, it goes clockwise. If you give it true, it goes anti-clockwise. Yeah. Um, so then we say, let's begin our path, and we just put in the values there. I use math.pi times 2. If you guys are any good at mathematics in high school, you'd know that it's equivalent to 360 degrees in radian terms. And of course, then we can either use our stroke style and stroke, or in this scenario, I thought, hey, why not just fill this uh, circle up? So I've given it a fill style of black, and I say, fill the circle. So if we go and have a look at our plot, can you guys see that on the display? Yeah. So in the top left corner, there should be a filled tiny circle. It's got a radius of three, and it was brought in three <laughs> pixels from top and uh, left. So that sits in the corner neatly, and the other one was done with just a stroke. So that's why it's just got an outline. Cool. So I guess the next step to do would be to start putting in some of those labels that we have in our diagram. So let's say you are familiar with HTML. Um, most text that has been done in the browser follows a box model. You've got things such as um, margins, you've got padding, you've got floats. You don't have this luxury. I'm, I'm saying luxury because you know, maybe it's a good thing that you don't have them anymore um, in order to draw text on the canvas. There's a few things to uh, take into account when drawing fonts. Um, the font function allows you to set CSS-styled fonts, so you can specify what font size you want and what font type, um, font variant, and those sorts of things. When it comes to text align, that controls whether it's left or right aligned, that sort of thing. Text baseline is a very interesting animal. We've got various fonts in this world. Most things that go with the English language fall in a particular um, space, but if you start throwing funny things in, like integral symbols that go way beyond um, things like Cyrillic characters, uh, the center of the text, or the, the lines that you can use for um, relative positioning, are quite different. So 
it gives you a whole range of ways that you can say how the text ought to be aligned or to which part of the letter. So we've got top, hanging, middle, alphabetic, ideographic, bottom, but I think uh, for most things that you'll be doing, top, middle, and bottom ought to suffice. So I've got a list of things that we can start drawing here onto the canvas. Um, first off, we set the font. Uh, that call will basically give us some bold text, uh, 12 pixels sans serif. Um, when we say uh, fill text to draw the X, um, we give it in quotes uh, the actual text that want to be drawn. So you can see this is relatively straightforward, and then you plot the, the coordinate on which position you want it to be. Uh, y follows the same structure, whereas the, the zero, 00 coordinate in the top left corner, I don't want to have to figure out how far I need to offset that because I'm, I'm a bit lazy, you know. I, I mean, I know it's 12 pixels high, so I ought to do something with the halving and blah, 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 but we can, we can just say, Text baseline is top, which means that um, it, it places uh, the measuring point at the top of the text. So that we say, all right, I want to position A5 from the top left corner. The text will come out below this line. So you should just see the text plotted here exactly where you expect it to be. Whereas for uh, the bottom right corner, I, I really don't want to have to figure out how wide it is and then have to shift it back and up. I could just say, all right, align it to the right. So it comes out this way. This way, yeah. Um, I can set the text baseline to be at uh, the bottom, so it measures out from that way. So our coordinate will plot it here and then draw the text out that way. Simple. And of course, here's the result of everything put together. So you can see the coordinates at the top left and the bottom right there. And hey, we just drew a whole canvas coordinate system and it was a piece of cake, right? right. So let's draw a bit more exciting stuff. Gradients. You've got the choice of a, a linear gradient or a radial gradient. Um, I mean, you know how gradients work. It basically starts at one particular color and it fades to another. Um, with uh, radial gradients, you're working with circles and cones and that sort of thing. You, you'd have to use JavaScript for this and define a gradient object. So we've got a variable there called uh, my linear gradient. And we ask the context for a linear gradient object. Uh, so the parameters, x0, y0, um, X1, Y1 basically give you a star corner and an end corner for a line that you would plot between them. And that is the line that the linear gradient will follow. If uh, these lines fall within the canvas, then from this point or from that point onward will be filled with a solid color. You can make them go outside of the canvas and you know, you, you can, you've relatively good control over where the linear gradient goes. Uh, the radial gradient works with um, two circles instead and creates a cone in between them. So X0, Y0, R0, specify the first circle's x-coordinate, y-coordinate, and its radius. So let's say you want to create something that fl um, flowed from a red color to a white color in the middle. You specify a circle with a relatively large radius. The second circle that you would define would be in the middle, and it would have pretty much a non-existent radius, and it will neatly interpolate in a circular fashion. So we can use color stops to actually control um, how these colors uh, work in the gradient. Add color stop um, takes two parameters, so you can say, all right, at the zeroth position or the zeroth distance from the first point, uh, we can make it black. Then at one, which is at the, the far end of the distance between the two, well, so it's in the gradient, um, you, you can specify the next color, which for example here I say, well, it's gonna be white. So what we expect if we had plotted a linear gradient is that it starts with black and ends in white, easy. And you can just go crazy. You can say, all right, I, I want like at least five of them, and I want to go red, orange, yellow, green, blue. So as long as you plot these points between um, 0 and 1, then they will just come at intervals across the distance. And the browser will figure out for you how far along these colors ought to occur. Um, make sure that you always call a fill or a stroke afterwards. So you assign the gradient to be your fill style. Very easy. Normally, we are done with CSS colors. Well, we can just throw a gradient object at it, and it will take it. Then we say, all right, let's fill our rectangle, and um, it will plot um, a rectangle that has filled with uh, the gradient. So there's an example of a few gradients that I've drawn. So that example of black to white, you can see in the top left corner. Um, I created um, a vertical one by just making sure the plot goes down that way when we specify the linear gradient. Um, and there's two examples of radial gradients where one has been placed, uh, both points in the same center. Um, whereas in the bottom right one, I've got a point that will start at, I think, at the top, 
it's somewhere along the middle, and then the other one's been shifted towards the bottom right corner. And of course, the bottom right one's got multiple color stops as the previous example, so you create this nice rainbow effect, and you can do it for whatever you like, really. All right, so we can also draw images inside the canvas. Um, so we can use draw image, and we specify some form of image. You can use JavaScript or um, the image element on an existing page to throw these things in, and you just give a coordinate. Um, I'm not going to elaborate much on this, but draw image also takes uh, multiple parameters. Uh, so you can say, I want an image, but I also want to have it scaled at a particular size and then plotted, or I want to have it scaled at a particular size and then also moved, um, which is just the same call except a whole bunch more parameters. So let's say I want to plot a picture of a Nyan cat flying through space on my canvas. Well, it's relatively easy if you use HTML and JavaScript. Let's say you had um, an image defined somewhere on your page. Um, then, and of course, you've got your canvas. Then in JavaScript, you can um, find your canvas, get your context. You can also go find your image um, element. And then you can just throw it in the draw image uh, function. And then everything is very straightforward from there. And it will draw it on your canvas in the top left corner if you specify 0, 0. And because I've made the canvas the same size as the image, what you're going to see on the page is what effectively looks like the same image. It's a kind of ridiculous example when I think about it. Um, JavaScript can be used to do the same thing. And that way, you can do things like procedural loading and whatnot. So you can specify your canvas. Don't have to specify the image anywhere else. And then you use JavaScript to make a new image. You set the source to be your image that you want. And then on, using an onload function, you can say, all right, draw my cat image. And so it's relatively straightforward. Um, I realized that my talk was relatively quick. That's probably not a good sign. Yeah. Um, OK, so there are many more features, because I've just bombarded you with a whole bunch of stuff. Um, you can have Bezier curves and quadratic curves. So these are curves that you can find using points, and it does neat interpolations between them. Uh, got graphic states. So if you're used to OpenGL and this sort of thing, you can um, draw in a particular state and then apply transform and then reload another state and apply different transforms. So you have same objects with different transformations without having to modify the original object. Uh, of course, you can do rendering of web content um, to the canvas. And you can do animation callbacks. So once you start introducing animation callbacks, like uh, um, a looping function, you can actually animate your canvas and also make interactive games. So I've got a whole list of things that I'd like to show you guys um, that uh, make use of some of these features and tie in a lot of the other stuff that I've talked about before. Now, I'm not sure how well this is going to work with. Uh, uh, yeah, I thought so. I don't want to do it. There we go. So here's an example of um, flying through space. And this is all done using the canvas element. And it has this little control thing down the bottom here that allows me to interact with it. Um, we can, so it's, it's drawing um, star shapes. We can also draw things like just uh, plain circles, which, of course, we know how to do using the arc method. And they just increase the size as they come towards us. We can also offset the way that they're being drawn. So now we create this x wave effect. We can um, also introduce another y effect. And then it just goes all over the show. And you just feel like you're kind of drunk, which is nice. Uh, squares. And it's all done on the fly. Um, no, no flash required. It's, it's, it's beautiful. And of course, the fact that it's um, compatible across most browsers is also a really good thing. Um, all right, where's the other one? This one I thought was really neat because um, you see it often with done with flash. Um, you can do it very easily using Canvas. Got the illusion of a book. Um, why don't I just grab a page and flip it over? Very neat. Um, it makes effective um, radial, uh, sorry, um, gradients and that sort of thing to do all the shadowing. And we could just neatly create like a storybook effect by just pulling the pages and flipping them over. Um, provided it, OK, I didn't like that. Yeah. Uh, what else have we got? So this one's called uh, Blob Salad. Um, it's a little blob object. Uh, he's being made with a lot of uh, busier curves and points connected and uses a lot of physics to figure out. Come here, come here, look at you. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> it, it figures out exactly how to um, 
interact with uh, the edge of the canvas, uh, although this goes a little bit screwed up when you go a little bit too far. So there are some limitations. Ah. Look at him go. OK, so let's do some other cool stuff. Let's, let's split them in half. Ah. Ah. Yeah, I'm just going to hold this key press. And so of course, you see like the face are coming off, but you can still grab each fish. And then you can just say, oh, let's throw gravity up in the air, and throw them left and right. And ah. So there's a big collection of faces being flipped around. So yeah, it, it's still not completely perfect because of um, uh, updating speed and that sort of thing. But, and we can just join them together. There we go. But you can definitely create some very cool interactive effects um, that are, well, of course, compliant across browsers and don't need Flash, which everybody loves. Whee! Yeah. Uh, what else have we got? OK, so this is a, a browser-based game using Canvas uh, called Catcher. So there's cats falling from the sky, and you have to catch them. How original. Oh, crap. Come back. Right, there we go. I'm moving around. So we also have uh, mouse interaction going on here. Uh, and it just basically follows my cursor, and I have to go and catch these cats. Um, eventually, the time will run out, and I'll die, which is not cool, and I don't want to kill cats. Uh, I wish I was better at this game. Um, notice how we've got a whole bunch of objects that are being um, transformed using states. So we only have to define one of these cat objects, and we can just throw it down very quickly. Um, now, I'm going to leave Canvas right until later, because it's awesome. This one ties a lot more into the research that I do at my university. So this person uh, created a procedure. It used uh, Perlin noise to create uh, lightning in real time in your browser. Um, it's loading a few features, which is taking quite a bit of time because the internet's great. Come on, Kim. Come on, Kim. If I click, like made some lightning. Made some more lightning. Um, what we ought to be seeing is some clouds forming over the top, and you've got the whole rain effect going on. So I think that's what's being loaded there in the background. I might have to leave this one wait until a little bit later. Good old internet. <laughs> um, of course, I couldn't forget about this one. And hopefully, this one loads a bit faster as well. Um, I highly recommend you to check out paper.js. Um, there's a lot of experiments that have gone on with. Um, yeah. Um, this one basically, why is the internet here so terrible? Um, it follows the mouse, and depending on the distance that you are from the center, the center point becomes bigger, and it has tied in sounds as well, so that you can dim the sound by going close to the center. And it is creating these nice little curves going around. You can direct where it goes, so it starts following my cursor. And of course, the irritating sound just gets better and better and better. Um, I've got a feeling that it also has to do with the resolution that I'm running in, but yeah. No, if it, when you get to check it out, it, it runs relatively smooth. Um, there's a few other things that I've been checking out in here that are quite um, neat. Because you're getting a lot of real-time uh, transformation effects. So this is using a, a Voronoi grid. Uh, this runs a lot smoother when I'm doing it on the proper resolution. But basically, this is all done in real time. So you can do some very cool technical effects that you otherwise wouldn't be able to. Um, you know, it, it's just done so much neater with a canvas element. Um, what else have we got? I thought this one was pretty neat. This was from the same place. Uh, this is using a Boyd system. So it, we're getting pretty technical, but all this is still possible uh, using the canvas element. So each of these tadpoles is created, and they each have their own transformation state, and they uh, interact with each other um, um, using all this JavaScript code. So we, we have a nice way in the browser to display this, and we don't have to load big um, uh, flash objects in order to get this done. And the other beautiful thing is that this is now also interactive. So you can modify the source on the fly. You can give it different parameters for the Boyd system, and all the tadpoles interact differently. So the advantage that you get is you, you, you are capable of doing this with JavaScript interactively. Um, last one I've got here, Canvas Rider. And because the internet and the resolution sucks, I'm not even sure if it's going to load properly. Um, what these guys have created is um, it's, it's a game in the browser where you can bike around using physics, um, but the levels can be generated by users. So 
There's my little guy on a bike. Go, little guy. And I mean, I'm using the keyboard here to interact with this, so I'm, I'm controlling how he moves. And he can go, la, 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 la. Wee. And this is where things start going horribly wrong. Ah. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, these are very big levels that you can just play with, and um, in real time, you can upload um, new designs, and other people can immediately go play on those. So, it's, it's definitely um, very rich content that you can get. And if you can notice all the features that you've got in the background um, all loaded in using, um, you can either use images or you can just load them dynamically in the browser, like you've got the biker going around here and all the physics that go on with them. Let's see if I can make it. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. It's not going to end well. <sighs> Poor guy. Yeah, I'm just going to follow him. Yeah, I'm not really sure what happened there. Cool. And I'm hoping this one is loaded by now. No, I, I, I don't think it likes the internet here. But yeah, so um, the lightning one actually had neat clouds that you could just click anywhere. It would procedurally generate lightning going that direction. Um, Uh, surprisingly, there we go, that concludes my talk. Um, uh, you can find me on the internet. I've got a Twitter account, Tom for Bake. Uh, I've also got a website, thomasforbake.com. So if you are interested in any more of this kind of information, you can hit me up and uh, do some collaboration. Yeah, so that's my talk. <laughs>